Good morning, everyone. Would you rise with us like the mercury in the thermometer these days? We will sing, Behold Our God. come this morning to behold our God, to worship and to adore him. Our God greets us here, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Together we say, amen. Today as a congregation, we have uh, a number of visitors with us because we are celebrating baptism, uh, the baptism of Lucas Duma. And so That is something we get to enjoy and celebrate today. And so as we have been greeted by God, let's take a moment and greet those around us and say hi uh, and and welcome one another to church today.
seated. Today we have the opportunity to, to celebrate the sacrament of baptism, a sacrament that reminds us of God's grace, that reminds us that it is God who calls us, that he has saved us, that he is the one who rescues us and acts for us. And we see this this morning in the sacrament of baptism where, where God embraces Lucas and calls him a child of his own. So we are going to, to hear this morning some of the scriptural promises and, and what it says in scripture about baptism. And then at that point, then I'll invite Ryan and Kyla and your family to come forward and we will uh, celebrate with the sacrament of baptism. But first, after he had risen victorious from the grave, Jesus said to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, no. go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In obedience to this command, the church baptizes believers and their children. And so let's listen together to the promises of God which are confirmed in baptism. The Lord made this great promise to Abraham in Genesis 17. He said, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And in later years, though Israel was unfaithful, God renewed his promise through the prophet Jeremiah. He said, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. In the fullness of time, God came in Jesus Christ to give pardon and peace through the blood of the cross the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And after Jesus had risen from the dead, the apostles proclaimed, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Anticipating the fulfillment of God's promises, Paul assures us that if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. These are the unfailing promises of our Lord to those who are baptized. Let's also recall the teaching of Scripture concerning the sacrament of baptism. The water of baptism signifies the washing away of our sin by the blood of Christ and the renewal of our lives in the Holy Spirit. It also signifies that we are buried with Christ. From this, we learn that our sin has been condemned by God, that we are to hate it and to consider ourselves as having died to it. Moreover, the water of baptism signifies that we are raised with Christ. From this, we are to learn that we are to walk with Christ in the newness of life. All this tells us that God has adopted us as his children. And now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Thus in baptism, God seals the promise he gave when he made his covenant with us, calling us and our children to put our trust for life and death in Christ our Savior to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and follow him in obedience in love. God graciously includes our children in his covenant and all the promises are for them as well as us. Jesus embraced little children and he blessed them. And the apostle Paul said that the children of believers are holy. And so just as children of the old covenant received the sign of circumcision, our children are given the sign of baptism. And so we are therefore always to teach our little ones that they have been set apart by baptism as God's own children. Let's pray together. 
We thank you, O God, for our baptism into Christ's death and resurrection. In the beginning, your spirit moved over the waters and you created everything that is seen and unseen. In the time of Noah, you destroyed evil in the water of the flood and by your saving ark, you gave a new beginning. In the night of trouble, you led Israel through the sea out of slavery into the freedom of the promised land. In the water of the Jordan, our Lord was baptized by John and anointed by your Holy Spirit. In the baptism of Christ's death and resurrection, you have set us free from sin and death and opened up the way to eternal life. May Christ, who sank deep into death and was raised Lord of life, keep us and our little ones in the grip of his hand. May your spirit separate us from sin and mark us with a faith that can stand the light of day and endure the dark of night. To you be all honor and glory, dominion and power, now and forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, Ryan and Kyla, Isaac and Logan and Lucas, you guys can come on up. Isaac and Logan, do you remember your baptism? What's in here? Can you reach in? (laughs) What is that? Is that water? You might, it might, with how hot it is in here, you might want to, no? When you were little, when you two were little babies, you were just like Lucas. You were brought here, and your parents were asked a couple questions. They professed their faith. They said, we love Jesus. We believe in Jesus. And then I took this water, and I put it on your heads. And that's a sign for us, not just of me doing something. It's a sign of God's love for you that God loves you. And so when you see this happen to Lucas, this is a reminder for both of you too that that God loves you. Yeah, that's Lucas. And God loves Lucas, and God loves Logan, and God loves Isaac, and God loves all of us. And so this is a reminder for us of the promises that God makes and the grace that he has in sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And so I, I'm going to ask your parents a couple of questions, okay? I'm actually going to ask them three questions. I'm going to read all three questions, and then you can respond together saying, we do uh, God helping us. So first, Ryan and Kyla, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you accept the promises of God and affirm the truth of the Christian faith, which is proclaimed in the Bible and confessed in this church of Christ? And second... Do you believe that your child, that Lucas, though sinful by nature, is received by God in Christ as a member of his covenant and therefore ought to be baptized? And finally, do you promise in reliance on the Holy Spirit and with the help of the Christian community to do all in your power to instruct Lucas in the Christian faith and to lead him by your example to be Christ's disciple? Ryan and Kyla, what is your answer? We do, God help. All right, Lucas. Lucas's middle name is John. I'm like, like, in my head it's John. I don't want to say the wrong name. Lucas John. This is one of the most amazing things is that God makes promises to Lucas. And God also makes these promises to us. And so as we hear Lucas's name and these promises that God makes, know that you can insert your own name into these promises too. But... Lucas John, these are the promises of God that are communicated to you through baptism. For you, Jesus Christ came into the world. For you, he fought, he suffered. For you, he entered the shadow of Gethsemane and the horror of Calvary. For you, he uttered the cry, it is finished. For you, he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and there he intercedes. All this he did for you. Even though right now, Lucas, you don't know it yet. But we will continue to tell you this good news until it becomes your own. 
And in this way, the gospel is fulfilled. We love God because he first loved us. All right, I'm going to baptize Lucas now. All right, Lucas, John, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we thank you that you make us new persons in Jesus Christ through grace alone. We pray for Lucas. Lord, bless and strengthen him daily with the gift of your Holy Spirit. Unfold to him the riches of your love. Deepen his faith. Keep him from evil. Enable him to live a holy and blameless life through Christ until your kingdom comes. And God, look with kindness on Ryan and Kyla and Lucas' siblings, Isaac and Logan. Let them rejoice in the gift that you have given them. And grant Ryan and Kyla the presence of your Holy Spirit, that they may bring up their children to know you, love you, and serve you as their neighbors through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. (coughs) Brothers and sisters in Christ, we now receive Lucas into Christ's church. So I'm going to invite you to stand. So Ryan and Kyla have made a profession of faith. They have professed their faith. They have made promises. (laughs) And as a congregation, we welcome Lucas and we do the same. And so I charge you, family, friends, church family, I charge you to nurture and love Lucas and to assist him to be Christ's faithful disciple. We say together, with joy and thanksgiving, we now welcome you into Christ's church, for we are all one in Christ. We promise to love, encourage, and support you, and to help you know and follow Christ. Okay, you may be seated. One way that we, (laughs) he's not going anywhere now. (laughs) One way that we, as a congregation, show you this love, show you the love that we have promised to give you um, and that we want to encourage you and support you uh, is to give you a gift of a children's Bible. I mean, so this morning to mark uh, this special day for your family um, and for us as a congregation, we give you the Jesus Storybook Bible. You look like you may have a free hand, Kyla. Um, this is, this is my favorite children's Bible, um, which has surprised me when that's not the one that we've given you yet already uh, on your third time around. But, um, (laughs) but as you read this with your family, um, know, know that we as a church, that your family and friends, we are praying for you. We're cheering you on and we are here to help and support you do the important work to help raise your children to know and love and serve the Lord, to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And so read this together, share the stories, remember what Jesus has done for you and the promise that he has given all of us through baptism and that Lucas has received today. All right, you may be seated. As a congregation, I think we can welcome also with a round of applause, giving thanks. And I'll invite the praise team to come up. We're going to to sing in response We're going to sing the words of Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer one. We're going to sing, I am not my own, as a reminder that in baptism of the promises that God makes to us. Oh 
This morning's offering is for Hope and Healing International, and I believe that there is a short video. Perfect. Please give as you are able. Hi, I'm Peter Chalamulim, the Executive Director of Hope and Healing International. I just returned from a trip to visit some of our medical partners in Africa, and so often I'm amazed by the courage and resilience of kids living with orthopedic disabilities. I wanted to pass the inspiration on to you and say thank you for giving these beautiful kids the care they need. These courageous kids living with disabilities like bow legs, clubfoot, fight through pain every day, but they are strong and determined. They want to walk, they want to run, they want to play without pain. They bravely face casts, braces, surgery to straighten twisted bones. They endure difficult physiotherapy sessions and practice exercises at home, often multiple times a day, just to stretch stiff muscles and regain strength and mobility. But they are up for the challenge. And after all this hard work, these kids learn to walk on strong legs and run on straight feet, thanks to your support. The healing hugs given by friends like you mean kids with orthopedic disabilities are living healthier, happier, longer lives. There's a difference between a pain-filled childhood and going to school, playing with friends, and reaching their God-given potential. Because of the care you're making possible, these amazing kids are thriving. Whether it is a child living with painful club foot, club lip, or blinding cataract, you are changing a child's life with your healing heart. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord our God, as we give today, that we give out of the blessings that you have given us. We give recognizing that everything we have comes from you. And so Lord, help us. Help us to be grateful for what we have. Help us to give generously so that the good news of the gospel can be sent out, can be made known through the world can be made known through, through organizations like Hope and Healing. So Lord, we pray. We pray for the kids that we've seen in the video and the kids whose lives have been impacted, that, that they would know that you love them, that you care for them, that they are yours. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you received a bulletin this morning, it would tell you that our scripture reading is Ephesians 4, uh, 1 through 16. I'm actually going to change that. It's Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. And I'm saying this out loud partly because I forgot to tell Jacob. So we're just doing the first six verses, Jacob, of chapter 4. Um, a part of that is Ephesians 4, 1 to 16. It, there's a lot there. Uh, there. There is a ton to cover. Um, and Ephesians 4, 1 through 6 talks about um, fruit of the Spirit or, or things that everybody should have. And then there's a shift um, in verse 7, towards talking about the gifts that the Spirit gives to the church so that we can have unity. Unity is the overall theme, um, but we're going to focus on the fruit of the Spirit that we are all to have in response to what God has done. So Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. 
Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I am not a car guy. Um, You probably would know that if you drove by my house some evening during the week and saw that I have two Kias parked in my driveway. That probably is some indication that I'm not super into cars. Um, One of them is a minivan. I love my minivan. That probably also is an indication that I'm not super into cars. Uh, But one of my fondest car memories uh, that I had growing up was was just after I got my license, I learned to drive standard on my uncle's 1996 Nissan Pathfinder. To me, when I was a kid, that was the coolest vehicle that there was. Uh, My grandparents were rebuilding their barn. Um, They had a barn fire in 96. And so uh, through that, they had to, to build this new barn. They had to expand the manure pit. And so we had this whole big pit dug, and my uncle drove his brand new 1996 Nissan Pathfinder down into that pit, because he's like, I think I I could make it. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Um, So when I was 16 years old, got my license, uh, one of my favorite memories is learning to drive his Pathfinder. And when I say learning to drive, um, you may have a picture in your mind of him taking me somewhere out on the farm in a field or to some parking lot and showing me how to drive as standard. None of that happened. Um, Me learning to drive standard was my uncle, when I was helping him move, throwing me his keys, saying, meet me at the new house. (laughs) We had just loaded up the U-Haul. It was packed full. So he jumped in the U-Haul with a couple people that were going to go unload. He threw me the keys, asked me to throw a few things in the back of the Pathfinder, and then drive across town to his new place. So that was my lesson for driving standard. You know, but as I held those keys, I thought, "I I got this. I've driven a tractor before. They're standard. How hard can it be? There's a clutch, there's a brake, there's gas. It, it, it's simple. I drove a Ford 3000 since I was a kid cleaning out manure from the barn. I drove a Ford 7610 hauling hay wagons all over the place. They're standard. I've never stalled one of those. It's going to be fine. It turns out cars are a little bit different than tractors. Um, I stalled the Pathfinder at his driveway first thing. Um, I learned that tractors are much more forgiving than cars. Anyway, he he was moving across Fredericton uh, from Douglas to New Maryland. uh, And for those of you who don't know the geography of Fredericton, um, that might not mean much to you. But as a 16-year-old holding the keys to the Nissan Pathfinder, first time driving a standard, I, I knew what I was up against. I was keenly aware that to get from Douglas to New Maryland, I would have to cross the city, I'd have to go through city traffic, I'd have to go through all of the lights, and I'd also have to go from the bottom of Fredericton all the way up the top. Uh, The easiest route is Regent Street, but there are lights all the way up the hill. Um, How hard can it be? Like I, I knew what to do. Driving a standard, at least in my mind, was was easy. You push the clutch in, you shift gears, you let the clutch out, give it a little gas, and away you go. It's simple. At least the idea of it is very, very simple. It's the execution that I found a little more challenging. Um, I will say the reason why this is one of my fondest memories is as I made it across Fredericton, I never stalled once except for in his driveway. But that probably gives you an overly rosy picture of how well it went. Um, I never stalled once, but I had that Pathfinder dancing through every intersection. It was awful. The sounds that were heard, the the looks that I received, um, the the times that I rolled back and almost hit the person behind me and then just gunned it, and I had no idea what I was doing. Um, it, it It was scary, but fun, once I made it to the destination. I made it where I needed to go, but it was not smooth. 
Um, every time I shifted gears, there was a bit of a lurch or a clunk or a sound or a signal to everyone around me to get out of the way <laughs> because I had no idea what I was doing. I was not good at this. Now, when we get to chapter four in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he's shifting gears. He's shifting from, from one line of thought to another. He is, he's shifting gears. When he gets to the end of chapter 3, he's putting the clutch in and he's ready to shift gears. He has spent three chapters, the first half of this letter, reminding the Ephesians and reminding us that, that we are those who are called by God, that we are saved by grace, that we have been raised from spiritual death to life, that we have been forgiven and adopted and loved, and we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. This is all God's work. Paul has been clear about that for three chapters. God has done this. God is the primary actor. We simply receive the benefits of his action. But then as Paul gets to the end of chapter 3, and as he prays for the Ephesians, and he prays for us, and prays for the church, he pushes the clutch in. And then as chapter 4 begins, Paul uses a little Greek word, which is translated in the version that we read today as then, but is better translated as therefore. It's the Greek word un, and it's the word for shifting gears. It's the word for this is a time of transition. We're moving from one thing to the next. I put the clutch in. I'm shifting gears. And away we go. That's the word, un, that Paul uses to tell us. That he's shifting from describing God's gracious work for us, the work that we receive, to the way that we are called now to live in response. He's shifting from the work that we receive to the work that we are called to do. But when we get to verse 2, we might be tempted to think that this is a bit of a clunky shift. We might be tempted to think that Paul is like me, driving that Nissan Pathfinder across Fredericton, dancing through every intersection, not really sure how to shift gears or what to do. We might even think that Paul shifted to the wrong gear. Because after all that Paul has said about what God has done for us, after he's talked on and on and on about all the grace that we have received, Paul has us ready to do whatever it takes to make the love and grace of God known in the world. And so as we get to the end of chapter 3, and as Paul's praying that we would know the, the full breadth and height and depth of God's love, we get the, the sense that Paul is going to call us to do something dramatic and powerful. Maybe Paul's going to call us to get involved, to change laws, to do whatever you need to do so that people hear about Jesus. We might expect Paul to call on us to challenge the worldly powers, the powers that oppose the gospel, that Paul might call us to protest and to humiliate all of those who work against us so long as the ends justify the means. We might expect Paul to call us to political action and command us to gain political power. That way we can get the right people, or at least our people in charge, and we can make things happen so this grace can be made known. Paul has told us this grace changes everything. And so we expect Paul to tell us to go and do these big and powerful and mighty and amazing things. After all, we live in a world that trumpets power as the way to make change that views pride as a desirable attribute and that glorifies action and condones violence as a means to an end. And so in a world like that, we'd expect Paul to have some pretty dramatic instructions for us. Surely we need to get the message of God's grace out there by any means necessary, right? Like, that's the shift that we're waiting for. That, that's the gear that we expect Paul to go to when he's praying that we would know the full breadth of God's love. But then Paul tells us, you know, shifting gears, Paul tells us, be completely humble. Be gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. What is he doing? After all that Paul has said, 
After telling us to live into the calling that we have received, Paul begins with humility and gentleness and patience with small virtues. This is how you live in response to the calling that you have received. Like I said, it it seems like a rather clunky shift or like Paul went to the wrong gear because it seems so small. We'd like to think that there's something more productive, something more powerful, something more impressive that we can do. We'd like to think that Paul is going to say, go out and change the world and do these things. And we're like, yeah, let's do it. Humble, gentle, patience, be those things. The shift seems clunky because I think there's part of us that wants it to be something else, something more, something strong, something we can do, a task that we can complete. But as we will see, this shift isn't clunky at all. It's, it's a smooth shift because Paul knows that if these small virtues aren't present in us, Nothing else we do matters. Because these virtues don't come naturally to us. They are a product of God's grace and they show his power and his love and his grace at work in us to everyone around us. These small virtues are in fact the fruit of the Holy Spirit at work in us, fruit that must grow in our lives in response to the grace that we have been given. And so I want to take just a few minutes and focus on these small virtues of humility and gentleness and patience. Because it is through the increase of these virtues, Paul tells us, that we will be able to strive together, to work together, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And as one commentator notes, Christian unity doesn't begin with an external structure or a business plan or some broad thing that we have to go and accomplish. It begins rather in the attitudes of the heart, in the small virtues that grow as a result of God working in us through the Holy Spirit. And Paul knows that's what the world needs to see. That's how we can live into the calling that we have received. Because it is through these virtues in response to God's grace that our lives give testimony to what Paul says in verses 4 through 6, that there is only one body and one spirit. There is, we are united together in all of these things because of what God has done for us in Jesus. And as these virtues increase in us, our unity is strengthened and all glory goes to God. So, humility... Kent Hughes, a commentator, writes, humility was despised in the ancient world. It was seen as a slave-like quality. And so you would never go around and tell someone, you need to practice humility. What was admired was the man or the person who was complete and self-sufficient, the one who, who pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. That's who people said you should be. In the Roman and Greek world, that was the kind of man or the kind of person that you aspired to be, one who was self-sufficient. And honestly, that's what many people admire today. People who are proud and self-sufficient and self-assured, people who, who pull themselves up by their bootstraps, they're the ones we make movies about. They're the ones we celebrate and tell stories about in the news, but that's not who we are called to be, Paul says. That's not who we are. We are to be humble, to be completely humble. And humility is the opposite of pride. It's to think, literally to think lowly of yourselves, not low, like don't have a a horrible view of yourself, but to think of yourself more lowly. To recognize that I am not the most important person in the room and I am not the most important person in the story of my life because that's God. And after all that Paul has covered in the first three chapters, humility should be our natural response. Humility is recognizing that everything we have comes not from ourselves, but by God, or but from God and by grace. 
And so our standing, our position, our assurance of salvation and eternal life, it is all a gift of God. Humility is recognizing that. And rather than taking pride in what we have, or rather than trying to take credit and gain praise for ourselves, humility is giving thanks to God for all that he has done. Humility is gratitude lived out every day. And humility shows up, or, or it should, in how we interact with one another. It should show up in the church. As R.C. Sproul says, one place the church should never be is an arena of competition for glory or for self-exaltation because the church is made up of a company of servants who have been baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus, who have been baptized into his humiliation, where he came down and humbled himself for us. We've been baptized into his death, and we, we profess that Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us, and he went to the cross to save us. And so our lives, together as the church, but also our lives as individuals, shouldn't be about getting attention and awards and accolades for ourselves. Our lives shouldn't be about constantly feeding our pride, but we should be humble glorifying God and giving thanks to him in everything. Because with humility, our lives point to Jesus. Second, Paul tells us to be gentle. To be gentle or to show gentleness is to show care and compassion for others, even when they don't deserve it, even when maybe they have hurt us or done wrong to us. And throughout the New Testament, gentleness is described as a strength. But it's kind of described as a strength not to do something. Gentleness is the strength to refrain from getting even. It's the strength to refrain from doing to others what they have done to you. It's the strength to refrain from fighting about things that just don't need to be fought about. Gentleness is the opposite of harshness. It's the opposite of, of being quick to fly off the handle. Gentleness is the strength of restraint. It's showing compassion and love when we have other options available to us. It's what Jesus displayed when he showed compassion to the woman who was caught in adultery or when he interacted with the Samaritan woman at the well. He was gentle. And so Paul is saying, to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received, to live a life worthy of the grace that has been given to us. Not only should we think lower of ourselves, but we should also be gentle to others. We should show others the same grace and compassion that Jesus has shown us. And that's hard. That is really hard. There are times when we are angry there are times when, when we are hurt. There are times when we need to be clear and we have to speak the truth. But in all cases, we are called to still be gentle. And so we shouldn't seek to crush someone's spirit or grind them into the dirt, or we shouldn't seek to be harsh just because it makes us feel good to hurt them like they hurt us. No, we should be known for our gentleness because God has been gentle with us. In Jesus, whom our lives are to be patterned after, has shown us what gentleness looks like. And so in our gentleness, we point to Jesus. And finally, patience. In older uh, English translations, the word used for patience was long-suffering. And I like that. I like it because I think it captures better what, what Paul is calling us to do when he tells us to be patient, bearing with one another in love. Today, when we hear the word patience, we think I have to wait a little while. You know, I'll be patient by waiting in the car for a few minutes before, you know, something happens. I'll be, I'll be patient when someone shows up late by a few minutes. I'll be patient for a little while. It's kind of this time frame thing. But Paul is talking about long-suffering. 
about willing to suffer long for the sake of love. The Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible says patience is the ability to take a great deal of punishment from people or circumstances without losing one's temper, without becoming irritated and angry, or without taking vengeance. So it's more than waiting a little while. It's the ability or the willingness to absorb attacks and evil without seeking revenge. It's long-suffering for the sake of love. Sometimes, as Christians, we are so quick to get outraged. I mean, sometimes we just have a short fuse and we're just angry about everything. And Paul says we should be patient. But sometimes we're so quick to get outraged as Christians about every perceived slight against us. Sometimes we see churches and we see denominations split over things that, that we need not split over. We are not very patient. But Paul says in response to God's grace, we can live into the calling that we have received by bearing with one another in love, by long suffering by being willing to absorb the hurt and the pain that people throw at us and responding instead with love and compassion. And that's hard. I know we said gentleness is hard, but, but taking those attacks, taking pain, taking the things that people might say against us and not fighting back, that's hard. We don't do that naturally. That's the work of the Spirit in us. And we should be clear, this isn't something that, that applies the same way in every situation. If someone, for example, is being abused, we should not say to them, be patient and bear with your abuser in love, meaning that they just have to take it. That's not what it means to be patient and to bear with one another in love. No, we are, we are called to be patient. We're called to embrace long-suffering, but there are circumstances like that where we need to show patience through calling people to task, naming sin for what it is, and seeking justice. But in general, like in cases where, where someone makes fun of us for what we believe, or where someone disrespects us or is unkind to us and treats us unfairly, where, where someone depicts Christianity in a way that, that we don't appreciate, or where someone puts words in our mouths, our first response shouldn't be vengeance. We should be patient. We should be willing to suffer long for the sake of love. This is how we live into the calling that we have received because that's what Jesus did for us. Jesus absorbed our sin and he went to the cross and he suffered and died for us. And Jesus, as they nailed him to that cross, said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. We're called to have that kind of patience. So that in our patience, as we bear with one another in love, we point to Jesus. Now, as Paul shifts from chapter 3 to chapter 4, we might think that shifting to these virtues rather than telling us to go and do something impressive wasn't the right gear to go to or it was just a bit of a clunky shift. But Paul knew that if we are going to live into the calling that we have received, we who have received this grace from Jesus have to live with this grace affecting us in our day-to-day -day lives. It has to change us. Paul knew this to be true. He knew the importance of, of the fruit of the Spirit growing in our lives. And in these verses, Paul's concern is for the unity of the church that together we will live as the people we now are. God has done this, now live as the people that you are. And in order for us to have that unity, in order for us to make God's amazing grace known to his people, or known as his people, and to live in unity, then these virtues have to be present in us. 
We can't have unity in the church and among Christians if we're filled with pride and harshness and a desire for vengeance. We can't point people to Jesus if we look nothing like him. And so Paul starts with the attitude of our hearts. And he says to us, God has done all this. Now be who he has made you to be. Be like Jesus, who was humble and gentle, who was patient and who bears with us in love. Be like Jesus so that others will see him in you. Be humble. Be gentle. Be patient. Be that way to your family, to your friends, to your neighbors, to your church family, to the people that you meet and work with. Be humble, gentle, and patient. Suffer long for love. Be like Jesus in church and everywhere you go. That is our calling. As those who have been given so much grace and love and mercy, be the people that God has made you, that God has made us to be. And that takes work. It takes work. The Spirit is at work within us, but it takes work. Paul tells us to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Work at it. But know that you don't do this on your own. The Spirit is working within us to produce this fruit of humility and gentleness and patience. The Spirit is working within us to unite us together in the truth so that we can have peace. And as these fruit of the Spirit grow within us, our lives and our unity point more and more to Jesus, to the hope that we have. And it gives testimony that there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. As these virtues are present in us, our unity grows and we point others to Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to be humble. Help us to be gentle and to be patient. And by your Spirit, help us to point to Jesus and to look more and more like him so that he would be seen in us. Help us to love one another and all people like Jesus loves us so that in our unity, you would be glorified. Amen. We're going to stand and sing, Build My Life.
And we are sent as those to go in God's love to those around us, to show patience and gentleness and love. And we go with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Together we say, amen.